something huge is being built under the American Midwest. These workers are heading down into the deepest gold mine in the US. But they're not there to dig for ore, they're on the hunt for something much, much more elusive. And to do that, they're building the deepest, biggest, most high-tech series of caverns in the world. Once they're complete, they'll look a little bit like this, only much, much bigger. It'll be colder than the dark side of the moon, and contain not just one, but four artificial lakes of liquid argon. But this is all just one part of a project spanning nearly 1,300 kilometers. So the burning question is, what is it? Okay, now before we go any further with this video, let me ask you a nice, simple question. Why is there something instead of nothing? Why is the universe full of stars, planets, animals, and everything else we see and feel, instead of just being an empty void? Okay, so I lied about this being an easy one. It's one of the most fundamental and difficult questions in science. But it could be one we're about to answer with the help of Doom. No, not that. This. The Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. This massive project is the brainchild of Fermilab, America's particle physics and accelerator laboratory, consisting of three facilities spread over two states and buried over a kilometer underground. It's one of the biggest science experiments ever constructed in US history. Now, before we do the what and how, let's do the why. Time for a quick science lesson. To begin with, we need to explain two substances, matter and antimatter. Matter is everything you see around you. Anything that takes up space is made of matter. Antimatter has very similar properties, but the other way around. Think of antimatter as the negative of a photograph. When these two substances touch, they transform into energy. But where do they come from? Just after the Big Bang, the universe created huge amounts of matter and antimatter. And this is where things get strange. According to everything we understand about physics, the universe should have created equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Had this happened, both of these substances would have reacted together, turning into energy and leaving the universe highly charged, but empty. Instead, for every 3 billion particles of antimatter, 3 billion and 1 particles of matter were created. So the 3 billions collided, cancelling each other out, and that leftover 1 is what created you, me, and just about everything else in the universe. Now, why there was an extra 1 in every 3 billion particles of matter is a question that's had scientists scratching their heads for decades, but they're hoping the answer lies in these. Neutrinos. But for anyone trying to study them, there's a problem. Neutrinos are one of the smallest known particles in the universe, and to make matters worse, they interact with almost nothing. In fact, a neutrino could fly through five light years of lead before it has a 50% chance of being stopped. In other words, to spot them, you're going to need a serious bit of kit. But you know what? Spotting a neutrino is only half the job. What are you going to do with the data afterwards? Well, you're going to need a computer that can handle it. When I was swatting up on particle physics, I had about a thousand tabs open on my computer, and it was slow. But it would have been fine if I'd upgraded my processor to an AMD Ryzen AI Pro. Those chips have an insane amount of processing power. Lots of the construction projects we cover are using really sophisticated platforms that combine surveys, architects' models, and billions of points of data. And those platforms are increasingly turning to AI to help manage everything. How well your computer handles that all comes down to how good your neural processing unit or MPU is. They get measured in something called TOPS, trillions of operations per second. And the AMD Ryzen AI Pro can smash out a whopping 55 TOPS. 55! It can deliver on speed, performance, and because it uses less power in AI apps, it means your battery goes further too. The best bit of all of this is that you can try it for free with AMD's test drive program. All you need to do is choose which model you want to try, fill in your details, and in six weeks you'll be working on one of the most powerful PCs available. In fact, even for non-AI tasks, it's great. We actually upgraded our motion graphics computer with Horizon, the one that made these graphics you saw earlier, and believe me, it's made everything so much faster. 
Look, we love making these videos. So when you go and check out our video sponsors, it enables us to keep bringing you great content for free. There's a QR code on screen or a link down there in the description. But if you excuse me, I'm gonna go off and try and find some neutrinos. Now, Dune isn't our first attempt at neutrino spotting. If you're a regular viewer, then you're going to remember the epic Hyper Cameo candy facility that's currently being built in Japan. But there are a lot of differences. To start off, this one is much, much bigger. So what is it? Well, the experiment starts here at the Fermilab campus just outside of Illinois, where work is underway on this, PIP2, the world's most powerful neutrino particle accelerator. It'll accelerate protons close to the speed of light before firing them into a target, producing a focused beam of neutrinos. This grassy mound will angle the beam down to Earth towards two sets of detectors. The first, the near detector, is only about 600 meters away. After that, the beam continues at close to the speed of light for another 1,286 kilometers towards its second target, the far detector. Now let's quickly talk about scale. If I take this piece of paper and hold it here and then get my amazing little Stormtrooper torch and shine it onto it, you can see that all of the light appears on the card. But to capture the same amount of light from over here, I need a much bigger piece of card because the light spreads. It's the same thing with a beam of protons. Now, because the near detector is close to the source of the beam, it's fairly small, about 12 meters long and three meters tall. But 1,300 kilometers away, that beam gets several kilometers wide. So to stand any chance of catching some neutrons, the far detector has to be absolutely massive. Welcome to Lead, South Dakota. It's a town that owes its existence to this, the Homestake Gold Mine. When it closed in 2002, this had been the longest continuously operated gold mine in America and by far the deepest. And it's here that the far detector is being built, at level 4850. It's made up of a series of three specially constructed caverns, each large enough to hold the Statue of Liberty laid flat three times over. The detectors being built here are nearly 80 times bigger than the short detector facility. At 1,475 meters underground, these are the biggest caverns ever constructed at this depth anywhere on Earth. Still though, digging big holes underground, form a gold mine, easy. You've got everything you need. Unfortunately, that was not the case. When we arrived, the gold mine had shut down many years prior and all of those systems required either replacement or refurbishment. The 90-year-old head frame, the bit of kit responsible for hauling stuff in and out of the mine, was in good shape but needed a full renovation to bring it up to modern standards. That was no small task given its status in the town. Because this is a historic structure, we didn't want to affect the exterior appearance in any way. This is in fact, if you come to Leeds, South Dakota, this is one of the distinctive things that you see in, in South Dakota in general, let alone Leed. And so that was very key. And so we actually had to reinforce the structure from the inside, adding elements to, to make sure that that was uh, meeting modern codes and safe for mm -hmm. at least 50 years of, of continued operation. But it wasn't just the head frame that needed attention. The steel reinforcement that lined the shaft itself had become corroded and needed to be completely replaced. Starting in 2012, work began on painstakingly replacing the steel sets at 5 meter intervals down the entire 1,500 meter shaft. With the head frame and shaft restored, attention then turned to transporting the heavy duty excavation equipment down to the rock face. The shaft is a rectangle measuring around 4 by 7 meters, that's about two shipping containers. It might sound like a lot of space, but it's shared by utility lines and the skip system, which brings up rubble from below. The area left for transporting equipment shrinks down to about a fifth of the original size. You are limited by the tire, right? That's the only thing you can't cut in half and then weld back together when you get it underground. And so that's, that's how you deliver things. You take them apart, you bring them underground, and you have to reassemble them. And there was some big machinery to be reassembled. This is the Drill Jumbo. It's one of the largest vehicles used in underground mining. It consists of two hammer drills attached to a tractor body. These are supported by hydraulic jacks, which maintain the drilling angle. As the jumbos progress, high-pressure water is used to remove rubble and debris. Drill the horizontal holes that 
are used to load the explosives. And so you drill a series of about 100 holes per shot. Um, and like I said, you, you load about half of those. Uh, the other half are left open and that actually creates fracture um, profiles for the, for the rock to break. The surrounding rock is fairly stable, but a lot of reinforcement is needed to stop the caverns from gradually closing back in on themselves. As, as you create these voids, the voids want to close in. Nature abhors a void. So the caverns would not stand uh, on their own without this reinforcement. And then you look at how deep into the rock do you have to go to, to the point where you're beyond that zone where the rock is going to move. And so in our case, we have 20 foot long bolts that are anchored at the tail end. These enormous bolts create a reinforced grid spread out around every one and a half meters throughout the three caverns. The excavation was completed in 2024 after 800,000 tons of rock had been removed from the former mine. Neutrinos aside, it was a heroic achievement. It is pretty awesome. It's still pretty awesome. It's uh, awe-inspiring when you walk into these caverns and, and look at the size of them. Um, and in my case, I've been I've been trying to make this happen for 15 years. So, so to have that culminate into something that you can actually step into and look at, it's it's got that extra special uh, feeling to me personally. The caverns are currently being lined with shock crates and concrete floors are being poured, ready for them to be fitted out as a high-tech laboratory. The middle cavern is being equipped as a service facility containing a substation as well as a liquid cooling system to remove heat from the ground. Meanwhile, the north and southern caverns are being reserved for the neutrino detectors themselves. Now, this is another thing that makes June unique. Japan's Hyper Cameo Candy has all the detection equipment inside one huge water tank. But at June, four detector modules are being installed, each one with slightly different tech to capture a slightly different aspect of neutrino behavior. Now, like we said, each one of these is going to differ slightly, so let's have a look at how the first one is being built. This is a single-phase liquid argon time projection chamber. Inside are a series of precisely engineered screens, the anode planes. They're covered in 24 kilometers of hair-thin wire mesh, the core of the detection system. Each anode plane is built from layers of wires strung in different directions to capture a detailed picture of what passes through. To work properly, every array is precision engineered to lie flat within just a few millimeters. What you're looking at here is the inside of a prototype detector called Protojune, completed in 2018. That detector is then going to be housed inside a cryostat, which effectively acts as a giant thermos, keeping the liquid argon at minus 184 degrees Celsius. This picture shows the interior of a prototype cryostat. The stainless steel lining is mounted on alternating layers of insulating material. The waffle iron pattern is similar to that found on the inside of liquefied natural gas transporters. The extreme cold makes the steel contract, and this corrugated pattern lets it flex without cracking. Okay, but how does any of that help us spot neutrinos? Well, we can't actually see neutrinos, but the neat thing is we can see a lot of the things they do. Time for some more science. Now, we've said that neutrinos don't interact with much, but what does that actually mean? At an atomic level, neutrinos fly around, and the only thing they collide with is the nucleus of an atom. There's a bit more to it than that, but we're going to leave you to argue about that in the comments. To put that into context, if the nucleus of an atom was this orange, then the atom itself would be the size of Wembley Stadium. It really doesn't happen very often, but when the neutrino does collide with this, parts of it will fly off. And it's those little pieces that we can look for. Detectors like Japan's Hyper Cameo Candy are designed to spot the faint light this reaction gives off, known as Sherenkov radiation. Now, that's effective, but it does have its limitations. For one, it's not very detailed. A much more accurate way of doing it is by measuring the electrical charge that comes off those splintering particles. And that is where the liquid argon comes in. Argon has many benefits, but a big one is that an atom of argon has a relatively large nucleus, giving the neutron a bigger target. When the neutron hits, particles fly off, and the electrical charge they emit is spotted by the wire meshes in the anode planes. 
that creates a huge difference in resolution. Whereas something like the Hypercameo Candy can measure reactions in centimetres, the equipment at June can read them in millimetres. Now, if you're as excited as I am to find out about the secrets of the universe, then I've got bad news for you because this isn't going to happen anytime soon. They're talking about things kicking off in 2032, but on a project this big and complex, that's not exactly a given. What we do know is that at some point the PIP2 accelerator will be turned on and the two detectors will begin their work. Alternating beams of neutrinos and antimath neutrinos are going to be fired towards them. What researchers are hoping to show is that the matter and antimatter particles will behave slightly differently over the distance of the two detectors, and that will indicate why the universe has a slight bias towards matter, and ultimately why any of us exist. Or not. The results could be completely different, and just lead us further down the rabbit hole of the mysteries of our universe. Either way, there's more than gold in those hills. Remember guys, if you want a PC that works at the speed of light, then head over to the test drive program and try out the AMD Ryzen AI Pro at the link below. And as always guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you're subscribed to the B1M.